All righty, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our June um, RTD Accountability Committee meeting. Um, we are towards the end of this really um, interesting, long <laughs> reporting process. Um, and I'm excited about our meeting today because we will um, start off with a public hearing related to our um, draft recommendations. Um, we um, are, are excited to just convene. Um, so we are gonna go ahead and get started. And, and the purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for all who are interested in our recommendations. Um, yes, and this is to the, the larger committee. Um, and to be clear, this is a public hearing. No decisions will be made. No actions will be taken this morning related to the public hearing. Um, we, in addition to um, this public hearing, we've held several, you know, all of our meetings have been open for public comment. We've also held a, um, and circulated a uh, survey um, to get additional feedback as well. Um, so we really are trying to incorporate um, at all points in our process, public input. And this is a big part of it as we, um, you know, share kind of the, the meat and the chunk of um, what we've been able to accomplish thus far. So um, for those who um, wish to speak this morning, please raise your hand using the Zoom interface. Um, we will have Dr. Cogstaff on the lookout so that we are not missing anyone. And if you've joined by phone, you're, you're to press um, the star nine button to, in order to raise your hand in that manner. Um, all of the comments received via email, via the Dr. Cog website, or, or in writing have been automatically included into our public record. And any, any comments that we've received prior to this meeting um, have been forwarded to the full committee members um, so that we have an opportunity to review. Um, additionally, if you wish to submit any written testimony to be included in, our, in the official record, um, related to the public hearing or otherwise, um, you can email uh, Matthew Healthbant at mhealthbant at drcog.org. I wonder if we might be able to um, add that in the chat as well. Um, please feel free to do that um, in that manner. And committee members are free to ask questions of those who are testifying today. So the hearing is now open for those of you who have signed to speak up. Each speaker will have up to three minutes to testify. Um, if you have not finished by the end of the three minutes, uh, we'll ask you to conclude your remarks and uh, we will have a timer um, for you all to view as well so we can all be on the same page. Um, and then we just ask that you not repeat any points made by any prior speakers. Um, a statement of agreement with prior testimony is acceptable and appreciated. Um, I think for the sake of time and making sure we just make space and room for um, all and all comments that have been made. Um, and I, with that, I will pause and ask Melinda if there's anyone who has raised their hand to indicate they'd like to speak. All right, thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Uh, it looks like we do have um, our first speaker. It looks like we'll be uh, Molly McKinley. Um, I'll go ahead and allow her to talk. Um, and then Molly, you'll just need to unmute on your end. And then uh, you have three minutes and you have the floor. Great, can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect, sorry. I'm navigating on the app this morning. I'm, and I apologize for any background noise. I'm locked out of my office. So kind of doing this in a uh, unusual setting. Um, but good morning, I'm Molly McKinley. I am the vice chair of the Denver Streets Partnership. I just wanna first thank you all so much for the time and energy you've put in to this process um, and for hosting this public hearing this morning. First, um, the Denver Streets Partnership has participated in the equity work group that was convened by Mile High Connects. We really hope you'll consider incorporating the feedback and suggestions from that group as you finalize your recommendations. Um, regarding those comments, we would like to specifically address one that kind of rises to the top. We're sub really supportive of the Sub-Regional Service Council recommendation, but we urge you to reconsider including elected officials in this membership. Elected officials already have a variety of avenues to provide feedback to RTD, and we're just concerned about any power dynamics that could either intentionally or unintentionally 
develop because of their presence on the council. We really think that these councils should first and foremost prioritize the voices of existing transit users. Um, and we encourage you to amend the recommendation to reflect that. Next, regarding the Northwest Rail and unfinished fast tracks recommendations, um, we would just really encourage you to incorporate more recommendations around the other un incomplete fast tracks projects throughout the region. Um, we know that the Northwest Rail is a really important part of this conversation, but recognizing that there are also other projects that are incomplete and we'd like to see them receive um, some more specific recommendations here. Next, regarding the partnerships recommendation, we encourage you to more explicitly define the types of partnerships like nonprofit and local government and kind of associated ex expectations with those. Right now, there's not very specific guidance and it might be just more useful for the RTD board and potential partners if there were more detail. Lastly, you know, we're overall really enthusiastic about these recommendations and um, really hope that the RTD board moves forward implementing them. Um, we're especially excited about, like I mentioned before, the sub-regional service councils, the fares and passes, passes program, operator retention service, um, the COVID relief funds recommendation, as well as transparency and reporting. So thank you again so much for your time. And I'll be submitting these comments um, in writing later today, but really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other speakers? Uh, yes, there is. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Uh, looks like our next speaker is um, Kathleen Brackey. Um, I also do want to make a comment just to make sure if you would like to participate in this public hearing, you will need to raise your virtual hand. Um, we're not really taking Q&A in the box right now, so very sorry about that. But yes, if you would like to participate, please raise your virtual hand. Um, oh. Kathleen, it looks like we may have lost them. Oh, there we go. Okay, there you go. All right, Kathleen, I'm gonna go ahead and allow you to speak. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Uh, and then you will have three minutes and you have the floor. Great, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, wait, I, um, I'm Kathleen Brackey. I'm the Deputy Director for Community Planning and Permitting from um, and oversee our transportation planning team with Boulder County and really appreciate the opportunity to provide comments this morning uh, for your uh, consideration on behalf of Boulder County staff. Um, we're very thankful for the work that the accountability committee has done and all of the opportunities that you've provided for us to provide comments and input along the way. Um, in terms of the specific recommendations, um, we are fully in support of the recommendation to create the local service councils. Um, as we have um, talked before, we think this is a really important um, opportunity for more enhanced collaboration with RTD and local communities and to support community-based transit planning. It's also an opportunity for more um, accountability and transparency and for more access for people throughout our communities to be able to participate in the RTD service planning um, process. Um, our preference is for the county-based uh, local service council approach um, based on the Dr. Cog sub-regional forum. And, and we have some additional comments we'd like to provide around that that um, we'll submit in writing uh, later today. But I, I just think it's a, a, a great opportunity to bring together local communities and RTD and other critical uh, transit stakeholders to help um, create more voices around the table to support transit um, service planning and delivery. And it's also a way to help enhance uh, developing more resources for transportation and for transit in particular by creating more um, input and opportunity for um, conversations and potential funding uh, mechanisms for transit. On the um, operational front, we fully support the committee's uh, recommendation to simplify the fares and programs for um, customers and really to improve the customer experience and build ridership. We have some specific recommendations on how to do that. 
And again, ultimately, I, our preference would be to create a fare free transit systems and barrier free transit for uh, riders throughout the district. But we recognize there may be other ways to step into that and ways that we could, um, could work on that together in a more incremental approach. But it's very important that we look at ways to um, make transit access more affordable and more accessible for people and to remove as many barriers as possible. Um, we also um, support the committee's recommendations around service delivery um, and partnerships. And I think what's important about that, and it ties back to the local service councils as well, while these are individual recommendations from your committee, I think they, they have a really strong benefit when you consider them in combination or holistically. So the benefits could be greater than the sum of the individual parts. So we really um, appreciate and encourage the accountability committee's recommendations to um, strengthen more proactive partnerships, more innovative types of service delivery uh, for our community members. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up. I think I'm out of time, but just um, thank the, the committee for the work. We have some other specific questions we'll put in writing as well. So again, thank you for the opportunity this morning. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, any, do we have any additional uh, comments at this time? <clears throat> Uh, yes, we do. Thank you. Uh, looks like our next speaker will be Jamie Lewis. I will go ahead and unmute Mr. Lewis now. Okay, you should be able to unmute on your end and uh, you have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> this is Jamie Lewis from the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. Um, I don't want to repeat everything that's been said. It's been really well articulated. Uh, CCDC has worked with the Equity Committee, committee with mile high connects and we agree with uh, most of the recommendations. Uh, two things I wanted to point out by creating a BRT and, and a bigger net bus network, it really benefits people with disabilities and uh, wanna make sure that it gets on the record. Also, I wanna point out that with the partnerships, I, I think RTD is really undervaluating themselves as far as having an effect on the environment. And I think having partnerships with other uh, environment uh, groups could be possible uh, revenue streams uh, for RTD. So again, Jamie Lewis from CCDC, great work. And we look forward to uh, uh, the full committee. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I see we have uh, four additional hands raised, Melissa. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, our next speaker will be uh, Andrea. Andrea, I will go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Andrea. Uh, I'm so sorry, Menegel. Um, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now, and you should be able to unmute yourself, and you have the floor. All right, thank you. Can you hear me right now? Yes. All right. Um, this is Andrea Menegel from the Boulder Chamber. And um, thank you, I just joined the meeting, so I'm giving this comment real quick, but it was really important to be here today and to hear the recommendations and see what the accountability committee has put out. Um, I'm the public affairs director of the Boulder Chamber, but also speaking on behalf of chamber president and CEO, John Tayer, who is the former RTD District O director. Um, every day here in the Northwest region, we see the value that transit and RTD services uh, are relied upon and by our workforce. Not only that of Boulder, but it's really a regional workforce. We're part of the Northwest Chamber Alliance, and that's our regional coalition of all the chambers in Boulder and Broomfield County. Uh, the Latino Chamber of Boulder County, the LGBTQ Chamber of Boulder County, Louisville Superior Lafayette, um, Broomfield, and Together, we represent 3,700 organizations from the university to Google, to small businesses, to entrepreneurs. That's a workforce of 380,000 people. Uh, prior to COVID, we had 60,000 in commuters into Boulder alone on a daily basis. We need the service to return. And it's essential now, even as we see lower um, levels of commuting, 
that those that rely on it, that value it every day, that that's their only mode of transportation, have that restored. And what we do know based on the ridership up here is that we do have the need for it to come back. We believe we'll be successful and we can get there quicker if we have the flexibility based on the recommendations to allow the local governments and the local partners to fulfill some of the obligations where RTD does not have the capacity to, to go there. Um, we could be more flexible. We could be more nimble locally. We could be more responsive to those needs. While this then allows RTD to focus on the bigger regional picture, uh, the infrastructure, the, the broader kind of strategy to serve our region and lets the locals fine tune where we can deliver it locally. Um, there's no better time than now. We have federal funds coming in and we have an opportunity now to use these recommendations as a catalyst to do things differently, to make significant adjustments, to be more strategic in how we deliver these services. So with that being said, um, I just wanted to, to add those comments. I apologize, I just came from another meeting to be on this one, but it was so important to be able to, to be here today to just provide any kind of input. And at the Boulder Chamber and the Northwest Chamber Alliance, we are always available to meet with the RTD directors, with the, the team, the staff at RTD, and we have, and we will continue to, um, to, to look forward to that partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Melissa, will you call on our next speaker? Yes, thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be Justin Begley. Uh, we will go ahead and enable you to talk. All right, Justin, you should be able to unmute yourself now and you can speak. Super, thank you. Uh, my name is Justin Begley. I'm a principal planner with the city county of Denver. Uh, I work on the transit planning team. So we work with RTD uh, quite a bit. Um, many of the folks who are on this call um, have been along for the ride for about a year now, and, and it's been fascinating and super productive following the uh, work of, of the committee. I want to thank the committee because you took on some big, big topics and made real change. Um, honestly, looking at the change made to date, um, the, the biggest thing that jumps out to me is that lifting of that artificial fare recovery constraint. Um, I think by doing that, we're going to open up opportunities to let RTD do their job better by not having to kind of massage things to meet certain goals and numbers. And actually it's, it was law. So, I mean, you don't have a lot of options there, but kind of to that front on letting RTD do its job on giving it more um, flexibility. I would want to caution against um, a one size fits all strategy around the service council concept. I, I do think the concept has a lot of value and it could be integral for generating more input into the service planning process. Like, it's hard in a district this big, I would imagine, to get everybody's voices heard and we can use service councils to further that. Um, I, I would recommend that we allow service councils in different areas to charter their own role with some constraints, obviously, but I just wanna caution against what may work for one community and what a service council does may not be the best fit for, for everywhere. Uh, and concentrating the development of service plans into a very small stakeholder group could be laden with a lot of kind of unintended consequences. Again, what may be right for some folks may not be right for, for everybody. So um, that's really my, my only thought. Uh, you know, my other piece is, you know, let's partner with RTD to make transit more attractive and effective throughout the, the district. And we're here to work with our partners in the region, RTD. Um, and we want to see, you know, what comes out of this uh, the accountability committee's work translate into, into more really good change and bringing people back to transit. So thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Justin, for your comments. I still see two, oh, actually, I'm not sure I see any new speakers. So, Melissa, do you see anyone um, that hasn't yet spoken? Uh, yes, we do have one additional speaker. Uh, it looks like it's uh, Andrea Suhaka. Um, I'll go ahead and unmute the. Oh, and then another hand just went up. Um, okay, and then, all right, Andrea, you should be able to speak and you have the floor. Yes, this is Andrea Suhaka. I am the chair of Transportation Solutions Arapahoe County, which is the <clears throat> excuse me, local coordinating council for Arapahoe County. 
I've been working for the past probably two years with the Arapahoe County Transportation Forum, which would become, I hope, the Service Council for Arapahoe County. I'm also on the RTD Citizens Advisory Committee. I thought that the recommendations were brilliant. I commented, took the survey and wrote many comments and I do believe the service councils are an excellent way to go. The Arapahoe County one is working very effectively right now for transportation issues. And I believe that they could take this on easily. I also urge you to, rec to recognize um, Dr. Mack, the Denver Regional Council, oh dear, Denver on Mobility and Access. I think that this is an important organization that's hoping to help seniors, disabled, and low income people, and they need to be recognized in your materials. I hope I was halfway clear in what I was saying. I'm just very nervous. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for taking the time to share your comments. I see we have uh, one other speaker besides Andrea. That is correct, Madam Chair. Um, it looks like our next speaker is Alex Heidright. So Alex, I will go ahead and unmute you. Okay, and then you need to unmute on your end, Alex. There you go. Am I unmuted now? Yep, you're good. Perfect. Um, this is Alex Hedright, also with Boulder County. Um, I wanted to thank the committee for all their work and echo all the comments that Kathleen Brecky made earlier. I wanted to add on um, some comments for one additional section, the use of federal COVID-19 relief funds. Um, I wanted to express Boulder County's support for all the recommendations identified in this section, but in particular voice our support for uh, three of these recommendations. Um, one, to share the federal funding with other transit service providers. Um, number two, to conduct a reduced fare pilot to help uh, rebuild and restore ridership. And then number three, to fund county caseworkers at county uh, housing and human services departments to boost um, participation and enrollment in RTD's affordable live fare program. Um, and so I really think that those uh, three pieces will be beneficial in helping to bring back ridership um, as we emerge from the pandemic, as well as um, increasing participation um, in the, the reduced fare program for our low income riders. Um, and with that, I uh, just wanted to thank the committee for all of their work. Thank you very much for your comments. We still have additional speakers um, still signing up. So uh, will you call on the next speaker? Absolutely. All right, our next speaker is uh, George Gersel. So I will go ahead and unmute you now, George. Uh, you'll just need to unmute on your end. Great, thank you very much. I'm George Gersel, a former Boulder County Transportation Director as well as worked at CDOT and other transportation agencies. I'm now retired. I wanted to just make three real points. One, the sub-regional councils are a great idea to increase local insight and in transit planning and coordination with RTD. Locals have a really good sense of what's needed in their area and can work with RTD to provide better service with existing resources. And that leads to the partnerships, which are also key in that with part better partnerships, locals will be more likely to add resources to the transit world, thus increasing the ability to provide service by RTD. And also to take advantage of local service providers who are available to, and can provide perhaps more cost-effective service on a local basis, um, thus in providing more transit service to more people in a more effective way. And then finally, to speak to Northwest Rail recommendations and support what the committee has come up with. Northwest Rail may be a good idea in the long run, but as it currently stands, it's not cost effective and won't serve as many people as the regional BRT. And I think the recommendations in the 
study are good for the Northwest Rail um, and the, the discussion. So thanks for all your hard work. You've done a great job on a diff really difficult, challenging area. And I want to applaud you for your work. And we'll look forward to seeing how the RTD board responds to your great suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Melissa, will you comment on the next speaker? <clears throat> yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, our next speaker, uh, their tagline says F Bruno. So uh, I will go ahead and unmute you. And if you could just state your full name for the record, we would appreciate that. Um, let's see. All right, there you go. You're, you're ready to go. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is Frank Bruno. Uh, sorry for the F Bruno, that was my email. Uh, so anyway, thank you. I just want to thank the committee for all of the hard work that uh, you guys have put in over the year. It's been a monumental effort. Um, I'm the chief executive officer of VM Mobility Services. We serve Boulder County and the four county Denver metropolitan area with paratransit and commuting transit as well. We are a partner of RTD uh, in some cases on some services. And I want to uh, focus in on, on three main points. One is sub-regional councils. I think it's a, a very good idea for uh, really uh, getting the, the uh, representation out into the communities. I think it's a, a great way to do that. I would echo one of the comments earlier that uh, perhaps it not focus solely on elected officials, because I, again, I think there are other avenues for uh, electeds to, to have input. Uh, Partnerships, I think that is essential. Uh, again, I mentioned that VM Mobility Services is currently a partner with RTD on Accessoride and Flexride services. And I think it's been a, a great way to help RTD extend the breadth and, uh, and, and quality of their services. And uh, it also complements what VM Mobility Services has done for the past 41 years with our own paratransit service, our own branded service. And we, we are investing, uh, our board is helping direct, we've just completed a new strategic plan and we are ready to continue making investments in our uh, fleet and equipment uh, to be able to, to uh, serve more in the region. And then finally, the COVID dollars, yes. Uh, I think that it would be great uh, if the committee could uh, work with RTD to figure out ways for some of the other partners uh, that have been uh, very directly impacted by uh, by ridership levels and and other elements of cost structure related to COVID, if we could see some benefit directly, more directly from the relief dollars as they continue to flow. Uh, but again, I want to thank the committee uh, and people in the region for doing this work, taking this on. Uh, it's been a, a long, hard task for you guys, and you've had an impact. And the only thing I would say is that occasionally when, when efforts like this end, uh, that unless there's a mechanism for continuing the follow-up, that uh, uh, things can tend to go back into old patterns. So I would just encourage you to, to think about that. So thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your comments. And we will, um, Melissa will call in the next speaker. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. All right, looks like our next speaker is Joni Lyons. Um, so Joni will unmute you now. You'll just need to unmute on your end. And you Can have- you... Perfect, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Hello, everyone. My name is Joan Lyons. I apologize for the Joni Act. For whatever reason, I can't change it on this call. But my name is Joan Lyons. I am a planning and TDM projects manager for Boulder Transportation Connections. We're a transportation management organization for the city of Boulder. And we also do other things in the region, working primarily with the Boulder Chamber, who we heard speak earlier today. Um, we just recently integrated with them um, as a formalized transportation management association. I am also a RTD Citizens Advisory Committee chair, um, as well as uh, a board director for um, Boulder Bicycle. And I'm already heard a lot of really great comments from various different individuals who spoke before me, but I wanted to bring up something more particularly in the partnership section. 
Well, I'm very excited to see that there is opportunity to partnership with um, TMOs, local governments. Um, I think that it's really important to also think and consider other micromobility service providers, primarily um, Boulder B Cycle, who is a nonprofit organization, as well as VIA. Um, thanks again, Frank, for those comments. I thought they were great. Um, but I just want to make sure that other micromobility service providers that are nonprofits in our region are also recognized in this report. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Joan. Melissa, will you call on our next speaker? Uh, at this time, I do not see any other hands raised for our public hearing. Okay, um, what, do we have anyone who has called in um, that needs to needs an opportunity to, to speak? Uh, I do not see anyone that's called in uh, via phone number. Okay. All right. I'm going to ask to see if there are any comments from the committee um, at this time. Crystal, are we going to discuss recommendations at the end as well? Is this just a time to comment on? or ask questions of anything we've heard? Or is this our discussion time? So this is uh, an opportunity to comment, uh, I believe on the, the com comments being made later in the agenda. I see that we have um, a discussion on draft recommendations plan. So I'm assuming that that's where we'll have that larger conversation. Great, thanks. Well. I would just want to thank everybody that took the time to call and talk to us today. We really appreciate it. Also, the folks that took the survey and provided additional feedback. It is super helpful, and that's exactly what we want. And um, you can continue providing feedback. We're not quite done with this process yet. So um, thanks again to everyone. Uh, Deborah, did you want to share some comments? I saw that you um, are on camera now. Yes, good morning, um, Madam Chair, and to all those that are assembled. I just want to say thank you for the work. I just joined in as I had an appointment this morning, so I'm playing catch up. But um, uh, we'll offer comments later if appropriate. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. Any other committee comments or questions? Okay, and I just, I wanna echo um, the, the thanks that has been shared. I appreciate you all taking the time to go through our recommendations and following this process. Um, it's been a, a really robust one at that. Um, and to, you know, share your you know, last comments as we start to finalize um, what these recommendations will look like. So thank you all very much. And that brings this morning's public hearing to a close. Thank you all for your testimony and your interest. And on that note, um, we have um, the next item on our agenda is a um, any edits or and approval of our meeting summaries. And that's from several meetings ago. Did anyone have any changes um, that needs to be made or any comments on, on those meeting summaries? Alrighty, not seeing any, wonderful. And we'll move on to our co-chairs report. Um, Elise, did you wanna share our update from our presentation? Sure, I just um, really briefly, Crystal and I um, presented to the Northwest Mayors and Commissioners Coalition a week or so ago. Um, we gave them an updated presentation on the, the draft final recommendations and collected feedback from them. The three major comments from them is that they wanted us to delete bullet six in the Northwest Rail Unfinished Fast Tracks Corridor recommendation. They didn't think that was a, a helpful addition. Um, they encouraged us to explore the magnitude of light rail fare evasion, thinking that it might have an impact on revenues. And um, they suggested that we consider adding a requested timeline for RTD to pursue implementation of our recommendations. So 
that was their feedback. And I just wanted to add that to the public record along with all the other feedback we've been getting. Thanks, Lisa. I don't have anything in addition, um, only to say, um, just to add to that point, um, we will be at, later in the agenda talking about all of our recommendations and we can talk about how we want to address um, the recommendations that have come in, how they will be memorialized in that final report, if at all, um, just kind of bringing some of those topics back up for discussion as well. So um, there's nothing else on our part, so I'll hand it off back to you, Elise, um, to run the rest of the meeting. All right, thank you, Crystal. Um, we, next up, we have two presentations from RTD. Uh, one is just the regular update followed by an update on um, expenditure of the COVID relief funds. So let me turn it over to um, CEO Deborah Johnson and, uh, and Doug McLeod to see who is going to be making those presentations. Well, thank you so much, Madam Chair, once again, for the opportunity to join you. Considering that I didn't think I'd be here in time, I'm going to yield the floor to our CFO, Doug McLeod, uh, to provide the updates. We're in capable hands. And so with that, Mr. McLeod, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, General Manager Johnson and Madam Chair. Uh, just a quick, few quick updates, and I'll, I'll allow uh, General Manager Johnson to supplement my comments, but quick updates on RTD. Um, as many of you know, we implemented our June 13th service change yesterday. Uh, that includes some service changes um, that were planned and discussed with the board over the last the board of RTD over the last couple of months. Um, another big uh, item that came with that is that we, as a company, RTD eliminated the capacity restrictions that we have on our services. Uh, we do believe that will uh, help us. Um, with our staffing and, and providing service, but we're also very cautious about that approach. Um, General Manager Johnson has directed us to uh, keep a very close eye on how things are progressing. We still have a mask mandate in place for all customers as well as operators. Anybody who uses our services must wear a mask. Um, there's a public health emergency that has not been lifted fully, even though there are some relaxation in some of the rules in publicly and throughout the counties within the district. However, RTD wants to take a cautious approach, uh, carefully monitor uh, any outbreaks, monitor the number of COVID infections uh, out there in the public, and uh, we will adjust accordingly going forward. Uh, a couple other updates for RTD. Um, in, on June 15th, tomorrow night, we will have a financial administration and audit committee as well as an operations committee uh, with the board. Uh, one of the primary discussion items that this uh, this team might be interested in is there will be initial discussions about the August and September service changes that we plan to implement or at least start discussing. Uh, there's been a lot of public comment regarding those and we will go forward and, and begin discussions with the RTD board about what the initial look of that might be. Uh, with the intention as, as we go through run boards, new service changes uh, at each approximate three to four month interval that we intend to add back service as warranted. Um, also in July, uh, we will continue, that, that's tomorrow night, then going into July, we will also continue the run board discussions with the board as uh, we see uh, developments happen regarding COVID as well as return to work with uh, customers, return of students, and then our capacity issues. Um, and then furthermore, we will also discuss the uh, 2021 amended budget with the board. So we anticipate uh, this, having a, an in-depth discussion about the impact of COVID relief funds, which have been discussed here, as well as the uh, expense impact of some of the items that are being reinstated. We will need, need to have the board's appropriation and approval of those items uh, to adjust our budget for the remainder of 2021. Um, we do look forward to receiving the comments from, or the recommendations from the accountability committee. We've already been reviewing some of those draft comments in, or recommendations internally. Uh, the plan going forward, of course, is the 45-day turnaround, and uh, we would get with the RTD board to discuss responses to those recommendations. And uh, those conclude my comments, and I would turn it over to General Manager Johnson to supplement my comments. Thank you very much, Mr. McLeod. 
Um, just some additional information as we talk about looking at reinstating service, one thing that's paramount in which we are doing is using our service equity analysis, recognizing that there's, there's threshold, uh, there's a threshold criteria specified in Title VI of the Civil Rights Act that states if a route is modified more than 25%, we have to do a service equity analysis. So along the lines of doing engagement uh, in reference to the proposed service changes, uh, service equity analysis is being done simultaneously as well. That's our guiding post as we go forward, recognizing it was specified by the Federal Transit Administration back in April 2020, that a service equity analysis would have to be done. So in light of the service changes that were made just yesterday, uh, the service equity analysis from that previous service change, as well as the forthcoming one, we use that as a guidepost to ensure that there is equity amongst the communities um, as we make decisions going forward. So that's a very important point to qualify. Um, additionally, as we do make those service modifications as relates to the vehicle capacity, it's incumbent upon everyone to adhere to the Transportation Security Administration mandate that still remains in effect until September 13th. I know there's been some confusion in reference to all these different entities, i.e. CDC said something just the other day, but recognizing that the transportation uh, Security Administration has auspices over that, and we are still in this pattern of uh, requiring our customers to wear masks on board any type of transportation, be it surface or aviation, for those of you that have dared out and have been on airplanes as well. So um, last but not least, as Mr. McLeod stated, uh, thank I wanna thank the Accountability Committee uh, for the uh, recommendations. And we are recognizing that we had conversations looking at those and we have a schedule and work and we'll work in tandem with our board um, as we look at uh, providing uh, responses to those. So uh, with that, I thank you once again and I will yield the floor and turn it back over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any questions from the committee on RTD's update before they go? You're gonna go into more details on your COVID spending, correct? Okay, right. so just any general questions on their updates to date? Seeing now, why don't you go ahead and give us the update on your, your um, COVID relief funding spending, and then we'll check in with the committee after that. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. This is Doug McLeod. Uh, we just have a one-page document that was shared with the Accountability Committee, um, but I will try to pull it up on the screen. So hopefully you can see that. Um, what we have, uh, what we would like to do is just give an update to the accountability committee on where we stand with the three apportionments that RTD has been awarded uh, for COVID relief funding. Um, as the, the committee is aware, we did have the CARES funding that was awarded back in early uh, 2020. Um, we expeditiously drew that money and applied uh, eligible expenditures to draw that money. With each one of these apportionments, the three apportionments that were awarded through the FTA to RTD, um, the intent of those is like any other grant in which we draw uh, after we spend the money. So we can submit for reimbursement for eligible expenditures after the fact. So it's just a reminder that we do not receive the money up front um, in one big bucket. We actually have to wait for guidance from the FTA about what uh, uh, eligible expenditures qualify for those particular apportionments. Then we have to get uh, go through a process with the FTA in which we uh, we apply for the grant and, and show our intended eligible expenditures that we intend to uh, be reimbursed for. Uh, then the grant is executed. So in the case of the CARES, that one is fully executed, fully drawn. That was $232.3 million. Uh, we completed that draw in 2020. The CRISA funding uh, was awarded in uh, January of 2021 of this year. Uh, just last month, uh, RTD was notified of the execution of that award. It took some time to get direction from the FTA and understand exactly uh, what eligible expenditures qualified for. Very similar to the CARES draw, it was for uh, maintaining operations throughout the COVID crisis. Uh, that funding is 203.4 million. And as you can see there, we've drawn 69.7 million. And I would like to point out that uh, we're going to be consistent uh, in the application of our eligible expenditures, at least for those, uh, at least for CRISA and CARES grants um, in what we're drawing for, from. 
So those would include eligible uh, employee wages and benefits that we have maintained our operations with, uh, contracted service for bus and contracted service for rail. In both those cases, we contract with third parties, Denver Transit Partners, for instance, on the uh, commuter rail lines, most of the commuter rail lines, except for North Metro. Um, we have a concessionaire agreement that we uh, draw based on those expenditures. And the way the process works for RTD in terms of submitting these reimbursement requests is we wait for the month end to close in the accounting area. So we have eligible expenditures for the month that are final. And then we draw, we separate out those eligible expenditures according to what qualifies under each one of the apportionments and submit a draw to the FTA and um, are reimbursed. Uh, there is a lot of oversight, uh, as you can imagine, on each one of these apportionments. Uh, there will be a lot of audits that occur down the road um, to ensure that the COVID funding was used as intended. And so we're being very, um, in addition to being expeditious, we're being very careful as we do with all of our grants and, and eligible expenditures and trying to be consistent to make the process smooth. Uh, those expenditures that we've drawn on Chris of $69.7 million represent expenditures incurred in 2021 from the January through April time periods. Uh, going forward, uh, since we just received the execution award in May, we were able to do uh, um, a catch up draw essentially in, of $69.7 million, but we essentially intend to draw each month going forward as we close those months out. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to draw the full amount by the end of 2021. The ARPA funding, American Rescue Plan Act, that is still in um, discussions in terms of what will be eligible expenditures. I know General Manager Johnson has had some discussions with the FTA. We believe we are close uh, to getting more specific instructions as to what that qualifies for. Um, it's again, structured the same uh, intended for operations, um, replacement of lost revenue. That is $338.5 million. We believe we're close to drawing that funding at which point, or excuse me, getting direction on how to draw that funding and what qualifies, um, at which point, once we have more specific instructions, we will share that information with the RTD board as well as the public. So uh, all, altogether, we've drawn 301, almost $302 million of the $774 million of uh, the three COVID relief funding apportionments. And uh, General Manager Johnson, would you like to add any comments? Thank you, Mr. McLeod. Yes, as you were stating, I have had uh, conversations with the Federal Transit Administration last had a meeting the latter part of May and basically we are awaiting uh, direction as it relates to the ARPA funds. It's been made clear that Congress wants the money's obligated and um, we are still waiting for that guidance as you specified. As we go forward, it's paramount as we use this federal system and it does have a period in time in which it shuts down in the month of June. So we, I'm anticipating us to have some direction probably by the latter part of the month as we go forward. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank, thank you, you. I see we have a question in the chat from Kristen um, asking um, with the federal funding, how, much of, how many of the furloughed employees have been brought back to work? So a point of clarification, when we talk about furlough employees, basically what we required were that people took furlough days. And so we basically eliminated said furlough days. So none of those employees that were non-represented out of furloughed employees actually left the work site. They were just required to take a specified amount of days uh, during the course of the time period specified. Kristen, did you have more uh, follow up on that? Uh, I may, I possibly used the wrong word when I said furloughed. Uh, my question is for all of those employees that were laid off or who had to leave RTD are back at work. So thank you very much, Ms. Trustman. In reference to the question that you specified regarding the reduction in force, all of those employees that were impacted, the represented, basically were offered an opportunity to return to RTD. Most employees responded to that. Some took other jobs and elected not to do so, but we have made uh, rescissions to all of those represented employees. And so I don't have that qualifying data in front of me, but all of those that were impacted basically received rescission notifications and had the opportunity to return to their, 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 their duties. 
Thank Go you. Ahead. Other questions from the committee? Hi, Lisa. Hey. I'll jump in. I, I understand we're still trying to get some guidance from the FTA on how we might be able to spend down the ARPA funds, but I'm just curious, given maybe what you all might what you all might be hearing internally, is your sense that we would be able to draw down the CRISA and the ARPA at the same time, or is it kind of a sequence of events? Have, have you all received any insights into that? Yes, there are two separate uh, application processes Mr. McLeod specified and recognizing the time period, the draws could happen simultaneously. That's what I understand. We're waiting on specific guidance as I indicated in my previous remarks. It's the intent that Congress would like us to draw down on these funds in reference to obligating them, um, recognizing that uh, our legislators put forward this to aid us and they want to ensure that we're obligating the funds as specified in the legislation. Other questions? I had one um, earlier in our deliberations, a couple of months ago, before the ARPA funds, I think, were even um, approved by Congress, you had indicated somewhere in the neighborhood of $10 million would be available from this federal funding for implementation of recommendations from this committee and also the auditor. Um, and, and I'm curious what the, the current thinking is on that. Um, I'm hoping that number increases now that we have ARPA funds available as well, but wanted to get an update from you on that. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair. As indicated by Mr. McLeod, what we're, what we're trying to figure out is how we do a money swap, recognizing these monies aren't available to us until we expend them. So basically waiting to get that guidance so we know what monies we have available to do a swap since we're not reimbursed till after the fact. And so basically recognizing that there are ARPA funds that we didn't anticipate receiving, we need to have a broad brush understanding of what that is because some of those monies could be utilized for other operational components, which we believe there may just be a tad bit more flexibility as we talk about operations. So let me give you an example. When we talk about um, recruiting all those things that lead up to the overarching aspect of operating. So if we were trying to uh, bring people in with training and things of the like, it appears as if we could use ARPA funds because that is operating. So recognizing that we could have a line item that we specified for that, that could be the swap that we could utilize. So I know that's a round the way explanation, but I'm speaking in uh, generalities without having that specific guidance. Uh, but that's what we anticipate doing because we did say we wanted to utilize those monies for recommendations as well as uh, some modifications we're leveraging not only with the state audit but with the American Public Transportation Association's recommendations from a peer review uh, that we've conducted both in our internal audit section as well as some aspects with our security model as well. Mr. McLeod, is there something additional would you like to touch upon that maybe I did not convey since I'm not the financial guru? No, you hit all the points. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that response. I guess um, I just want to um, make sure that um, the committee is, is communicating in a crystal clear fashion about the point in time that we see ourselves at as people are returning to work and starting to normalize after um, in the post pandemic world. I know we're still coming out of that, but the light is shining very brightly at the end of the tunnel and we're starting to see a resumption of normal activity. This is a pivot point where people figure out their relationship with their workplace again and how they're gonna travel there. And we are very concerned that if we lose this opportunity to get people back on transit and introduce them to transit for the first time if they haven't been before, if we miss that opportunity, habits will become entrenched and we will lose that. And I don't think this is just an RTD issue. I think it's a transit issue. Some people have been very dramatic in suggesting that this will make or break transit. I think that's probably a little overstated, but I think it will take years and years and years for transit to recover if we don't get this right. And RTD does not have the financial wherewithal to, to um, have years and years to see if we get this right. So we think it's pretty important to act immediately to restore a right, a ridership and to use some of these unanticipated federal dollars to, to actually set, uh, set things back on track, if you will. Um, so we are, we are hopeful, um, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn by um, 
um, speaking before we finalize our recommendation, but we're hoping that some of these dollars flow expeditiously to implement our recommendations to restore ridership and really um, jumpstart things back in the, in the right way um, in the post-pandemic world. So um, I know you're waiting guidance, but just wanna make sure that you know loud and clear where the committee stands on this. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And you don't stand alone in that quite naturally. Recognizing ridership is just one aspect of an activity. We're looking more holistically at a ridership growth action plan. And one very important element of that is working in tandem with other entities because we have to ensure that people are coming back to activity centers. So we can provide a level of ridership um, or level of services to accommodate as such. But the main pivotal point in all of this is ensuring that we have resources readily available uh, because we would set ourselves up for failure if we didn't have uh, enough vehicles, enough dispatchers, enough street supervisors and enough operators. So all of that goes hand in hand. So uh, trust and believe your, your comments don't fall upon deaf ears, but we have to have an understanding of what our plan is holistically as we go forward. So thank you. Thank you. Um, other committee members? Do you have any comments, questions for RTD on this? Okay, well, thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is, um, I think, a staff um, presentation on public comment received to date on our recommendations. Looks like Matthew's going to do that. Good morning. Matthew Helfant, uh, Senior Transportation Planner here at Dr. Cog. There we go. I'm joined today by uh, my colleague, Lisa Hood, who's the public engagement planner, uh, also uh, Dr. Cog, um, and she uh, contributed significantly to the, um, the, the public and stakeholder engagement so far. So just a, a bit of a note, uh, this is, these are preliminary results that we're showing you. Uh, the, the survey closes tomorrow. So additional survey results will come in uh, and they will be provided uh, uh, in, your, in your packets for the June 28th meeting. So uh, uh, through this weekend, uh, we received almost 400 responses on the survey. Uh, so uh, definitely, uh, definitely um, you know, received some healthy response rate. Um, we, uh, we received about a third uh, from uh, Denver County, uh, but received uh, responses from, from all over the RTD district. And uh, about eight in 10 consider themselves uh, transit users. Uh, so on the first recommendation, the service councils, uh, there was um, significant support uh, for um, for the uh, draft recommendations on sub-regional service councils. Uh, so um, between uh, strongly agree and agree, uh, we're at uh, about three quarters of, of the respondents. Uh, pass and fare programs was also uh, very significant uh, uh, um, support uh, for, the, um, for the draft recommendation. And uh, service delivery also uh, uh, had uh, significant support uh, for the recommendations with um, strongly agree or agree being uh, the vast majority of, of, for each of the individual uh, recommendations. Uh, there was a little bit less uh, um, support for the Northwest Rail unfinished fast tracks um, uh, recommendations, but still a majority uh, uh, of the respondents supported it. Um, there's also significant support for uh, the COVID-19 relief funding recommendations that, that, that were discussed just a few minutes ago. Um, partnerships also received a significant support, uh, support uh, especially uh, the um, piloting first last mile projects to build ridership, especially uh, among uh, disadvantaged communities. Uh, transparency and reporting also enjoyed significant uh, support uh, from the um, from the respondents of the survey, uh, with uh, a majority strongly agreeing. And uh, we we did also we, we include some additional input, although there's uh, significant more significantly more input that has come in that will be shared with the committee 
And uh, this was already uh, referenced earlier by, uh, by Co-Chair Jones. Uh, so this was just uh, some feedback received from uh, the Northwest uh, Mayors and Commissioners Coalition at uh, the presentation that the co-chairs uh, made about a week ago. And with that, um, I'd be happy to take any questions. And like I said, um, Lisa Hood here is here as well. Uh, she contributed significantly uh, to putting together the survey and uh, all of the uh, public and stakeholder engagement. Thank you, Matthew and Lisa. Um, committee members, any questions, comments on public input to date? I think you can stop sharing your screen and then I'll oh. be able to see folks a little better. Sure. Thanks. I don't know if you were the first in, but I first I saw was Dan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, one question I would have is uh, what was the, uh, the platform that hosted the survey? How did people access it or how were they made aware of it? Lisa, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. So we use SurveyMonkey with Dr. Cog and we shared, so that's how we built the survey and used it. And then we shared, uh, we promoted the opportunity to participate in the survey through our mailing list. So that goes out to about 2,500 people on our typical uh, Dr. Cog mailing list. And we sent two of those, so right at the beginning um, when we opened the survey and then at the end of last week as well. And then we also promoted it on our social media and we asked our partners, um, including people on this meeting to also share that as well. So um, that's how I think we got a really successful response rate. Thank you. Um, Julie? Yes, thank you. So actually, I think that my question might be the next agenda item, but overall, I think it's great that we had so many responses. And then um, really, I wanna unpack that Northwestern mayor's recommendation. So that might be in the next conversation. So we can wait on that. Okay, well, let me just get questions and comments on input and then we'll come back to you. Um, Troy? Yeah, this should be an easy question. What was the number of surveys received for uh, the presentation that Matthew just gave? The, the number, oh. Go oh, ahead. sorry. We had 391 responses by, I think, like 7 a.m. this morning. So scientifically uh, correct when you get up above about 350 or 370. So that's great. Okay, thank you. Rebecca. Um, for the strongly disagree, was there, do you guys have a, a, a fuller breakdown of that or any summary you can provide? Did we get more information when folks were saying strongly disagree? Yeah, there's a lot of additional written comments. Um, so what we'll be doing once we close the survey tomorrow is that myself and our research team will be analyzing all of those written comments and providing more detail about more of the detail that was included in the written comments and that'll come in the next packet. Okay. And I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, the, uh, the, the, the meeting on the 28th will, will have an opportunity for the committee to weigh in on a draft report, which will include uh, the draft recommendations and any uh, possible, um, you know, uh, suggested uh, changes to those draft recommendations as of the conversation that that comes on the next agenda item, but um, anticipated adoption of the report that which will include the, um, the final recommendations is anticipated for um, July uh, 12th. So the committee will have ample time to, uh, to see all the uh, public comments that come in. As we stated earlier, the, the survey ends uh, tomorrow. So there, there will be additional public comment coming in. Thank you for that, Dea, and then Kristen. Yeah, so I wanted to just remind the committee, or at least mention to the committee that um, as a reminder, Mile High Connects, was charged by the committee back in, I guess, March, April to conduct an external equity analysis. Um, so as part of that, we brought on a consultant or a contractor, I should say, to facilitate those conversations. The committee or this kind of ad hoc working group that we convened um, provided a few recommendations as well, which you'll see in the recommendation packet um, or in the accountability agenda packet. Um, and these were separate from the 
overall equity assessment, but I wanted to just verbally share that with you all. There was a lot of really rich conversation happening among, among these community organizations that I wanted to make sure was captured in some sort of comment form. Um, so just note that those are in the, at the bottom of the equity assessment as well. And I wanted to check in with Dr. Cogstaff just to see how we might be able to include those comments either in the survey form or in some other um, some other kind of documentation for for public comment and public records. We will share all of the um, the uh, the public comments that come in in written form with the committee ahead of the uh, next meeting. Matthew, will we get a, a presentation on the equity assessment also at the next meeting, or are we just reading that on our own and not getting a presentation on that? We'd be happy to give a presentation to you if you would like. I think given the fact that this committee has emphasized um, looking through an equity lens on all of our work, I think it would be appropriate to actually have, I mean, I, I don't want to get ahead of my co-chair or anything, but that I think that would be appropriate. Sure. Release. Kristen, you're next up in the queue. I wanted, uh, thank you, Elise. I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Cog for being able to summarize and kind of shorten this survey to make it much more public friendly. I thought that that, that was an excellent job. And as far as the ad hoc committee data, I think that the people that were involved with that, uh, CCDC and the Denver Streets Partnership, uh, all these different groups were the correct people to have on that ad hoc committee because they were the folks that had the experience with, with all of these different things with transportation. So I think that that ad hoc committee did an excellent job. Thank you. Excellent point, Kristen. Thanks for bringing that up. Other comments, questions on public input to date? Okay, well, why don't we then move into the um, um, discussion about draft recommendations. Just to summarize, um, we're gonna have, be having a full robust conversation at our next meeting on the 28th because by then we will have all of the public input, their recommendations for changes to our recommendations. <laughs> and I, I think that's where um, the most substantive discussion by this committee will be on scrubbing our final recommendations. And then we'll have a final vote, hopefully to approve them at our last meeting in July. I should say last, we also have a meeting when we hear back from RTD um, in concert with the governor's representatives and state legislators representatives or, or themselves to hear feedback from RTD. But for all intents and purposes, the last official meeting, regular meeting of this committee will be in July. But we wanted to set the table today just to have some initial feedback on um, what recommendations uh, we might have around our recommendations, um, what the feedback that we've gotten to date has caused us to think about. And because Julie, you had signaled that you wanted to uh, add something to this conversation, I'll have you kick us off. All right, great. Well, I, I don't have much to add, but I think it's more of a discussion point that we obviously need to have about the Northwest Mayors and Commissioners Coalition and their recommendation, specifically that bullet six. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how, like what would the process be for us to, even um, make recommendations because we're not meeting at subcommittees anymore, right? So I guess it would have to be a decision from the overall committee at this point. Um, and so I think that, you know, for me, um, especially that Northwest Rail is very divisive, right? And so how do we, how do we, um, I don't know, how, how, do, how do we, make this something that is, is useful. I mean, I think the recommendation, um, I think the recommendation is, you know, it's, it's uh, 
trying to encourage right bus rapid transit services. Um, the, the biggest problem that I have, especially with the Northwest Rail conversation, is, you know, I feel like um, since that is such of a important um, community conversation that's been going on in that region for so long, I am really uh, in favor of listening to, I guess, the community members of that area um, to help us shape this a little better. Um, because I feel like, you know, this, this does have a really long history in the region, and um, I would like to see us, um, you know, really just kind of revise that and, and look at that. Um, and then I do also like the idea of um, requesting a timeline, and I know that's something that we talked about in the past um, as a committee, and so I think that that was a great point that we should add. So that's, that's really the only comments that I have, but I do feel like it's an important conversation for us to kind of um, unpack since this is a, a really important feedback. Madam Chair? Brett? Yeah, I, uh, I looked at that and uh, uh, particularly the request that, that item six be eliminated from it. And uh, because the Northwest mayor's uh, and Commissioners Coalition is such a key group for anything that goes ahead on this issue and also a group that has studied it for a long time, uh, along with uh, some of the other groups up there uh, and, and the NAMS uh, group especially as well. I decided I would uh, remove that uh, as they requested uh, and uh, sent out a copy of a revised version uh, to, I don't know how broad I, I sent that around, but I'm happy to share it with the whole group. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's no great loss to remove that item number six. Uh, and so I went ahead and did that and made a, a few other changes related to that. So um, I, don't, I don't think we lose the, the key part of what is, is uh, the idea and the meat of the idea by doing that. Uh, as far as the timeline, it's, it's kind of a difficult thing to go to RTD and say, what is the timeline under which you would implement this? Uh, I believe because we don't, we don't dictate to RTD what they do. We just recommend that this is something we think they should do. And it's true for all of the work that we do. So I was a little fuzzy on the timeline uh, issue, but perhaps uh, Elise, Perhaps our co-chairs can comment on that uh, issue of the timeline. I think it, it, it wasn't um, given thinking that this committee has any control over RTD. This is a, again, it was actually a Broomfield um, council member making the suggestion, which other folks on the MCC I think agreed with um, saying, when you give the recommendations, also recommend a, re a timeline for implementation that would be appropriate to accompany them to encourage RTD to take your recommendation seriously and move along with implementation, I think is the spirit of that. So Good. I think it might be useful just to step back again and look at our process here. We have a draft set of recommendations that are in writing. This committee has the ability now as the full committee to make adjustment, adjustments to those recommendations going forward to finalize them. We're not going to do that today, um, but we can start planting the seeds for areas where we think we might want to make adjustments so that perhaps staff can help in preparing us for that full, full discussion on the 28th. So um, with regards to the Northwest Rail recommendation, um, I think we should keep in mind, we're getting feedback from all sorts of folks right now, and we should probably ex uh, understand all of the input before we start making too many changes, because otherwise we might be whipsawed back and forth. Um, and the um, feedback we got from the MCC was just highlighted because we did a verbal presentation and they gave us that verbal feedback. So we shared it back and wanted that to be part of the, the record. Yes, it's an important group. There are other groups that will be weighing in as well on that. Um, so I think let's continue. If, if people think there are changes that they might want to see made to the final recommendation, let's flag them now. So far I've heard um, 
the idea of maybe recommending an implementation timeline to accompany our recommendations. And I'm flagging these so that staff can help keep a running list and maybe we can talk about um, uh, uh, with the agenda committee on how we, we move forward with potential draft changes. The other one was that we um, may wanna make some adjustments to the Northwest Rail recommendation. Are there others that people heard from so far in public input or uh, upon sleeping on our re recommendations that you have yourselves? Dea, I see your hand up. Yeah, so a couple of things stood out to me that we should address or at least revisit um, in our recommendation. One is around the partnerships. There seem to be a lot of public comments around including elected officials in the, part in the sorry, in the local service councils, I'm getting them all mixed up. Um, so we'd probably need to revisit that conversation and just be really explicit about what we mean there. Um, and the other, uh, I guess, recommendation that we need to revisit is around partnerships and just including an explicit definition of what do we mean when we say partnerships. Are we specifically talking about um, IGAs, for example, with local governments, or are we talking about very soft partnerships with nonprofit organizations, but adding maybe a little bit more specificity to that one. Um, there was another one around fairs, but I will come back to that when I get my notes together. Great. Julie? Yeah, Dana already said mine. Um, that membership membership section under the subregional service councils, I think, could be um, reworked a little bit. Um, I think that you know, when we had the discussion in our subcommittee, we really wanted to talk about prioritizing people and organizations that are transit focused. Um, so I think that we could we could um, include that in that language a little bit better. I think um, elected representatives are an important piece of the puzzle, although they shouldn't be the ones who dominate these service councils. So I think that looking at that membership section and really just kind of um, tweaking some of that language could really help convey our message a little bit better. Could I just jump in and, and provide a little bit of, I don't know, a counterpoint. Um, there are sort of two different visions of local service councils. Um, that have uh, emerged, um, travel shed versus county-based, but the initial, initial impetus for a lot of people in thinking through local service councils were Dr. Cog's sub-regional forum councils, which are just local elected officials and their staff. And so we then took that idea and said, but no, we need transit users, we need community members, and we added to that to now go full circle and say, and kick out the local elected officials, will, I guess, to me, um, goes a bit too far in terms of uh, straying from the model that we actually started, that exists now that works, that has worked well in the last Dr. Cog uh, tip cycle. So I guess, Julia, I hear what you're saying about redefining and, and making sure they don't dominate. I would have issues about taking them off altogether um, yes. So yeah, just, definitely don't want them off um, because okay. I think it's just such an important piece of the puzzle when it comes to not only working with staff, um, but also communicating transportation needs for that region on a broader scale. So I think they're definitely, they have a seat at the table. I think that we could just kind of looking at the language that's um, drafted right now, I don't think that we put um, as much of an emphasis on, you know, um, community, like community, like getting more community input um, and organizations, other organizations that are transportation focused um, in here as I think the conversation led to. So yes, yeah, keep elected officials. Uh, let's beef up the language around, um, you know, community, I guess, input. We do have transit users on there, but I'm not seeing, um, you know, there's lots of other organizations that could that could potentially help um, bring that perspective to the service council. So yes, I agree with you, Lee. Great. Other issues that people want to highlight where they think we might want to be making adjustments to our recommendations. Lisa, I don't have a specific um, 
comment on on the content of the the recommendations at the time at the at this time but i did just want to like bring up again um how we are memorializing the public feedback in the actual report um are we going to include that as an appendix um some of these draft the, the reports um, that we end up with from the survey um and any analysis that we do to kind of dig deeper into the uh written comments that we've received since the the very get beginning of our conversations i would think it would be appropriate to have an appendices around public input but um let's let's turn it over to dr cog staff to see if they had specific ideas around that Co-Chair Jones, I was just about to say about the same thing that you just said. Okay, so, great. Uh, I, yeah. sorry, sorry, Matthew, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. That was it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I was just going to concur. And that's why I brought it up. I just wanted everyone to be aware of how we'll be handling um, the, the many um, the feedback um, points that we've gotten and how they'll be memorialized. Um, I know that it's not often clear. Um, I, I, you know, just I think it's important to memorialize where certain suggestions might have come from, the the broad support, um, and just kind of broad spectrum of uh, feedback overall. So I do think it's a good thing to include. Good, good point. Thanks for bringing that up, Daya. Thanks, Liz. I'm going to go back to what I finally remembered um, around the FAIRS recommendation. And this might actually be part of the public comment process, but um, we certainly received a lot of feedback on the proposal around free fares and simplifying the fare structure and simplifying the eco class structure. Given that RTD is also going through their own internal um, fare study, it almost seems like there, there's a lot of rich information in here for the RTD staff to consider separate from the recommendation that we're making. Um, so I just want to lift that up that yes, this is really valuable feedback for us, but also I guess a question how might RTD, in addition to what we've provided as recommendation, use this public comment to inform their internal processes? Um, it's not really a question, but more of a reflection that we might just want to consider and, and be more explicit in our recommendation that RTD is going through their own fair study and these may be taken up for consideration as part of that. So I just want to comment or comment on that. Lynn, do you have thoughts on how we might flag this input that we're receiving for RTD's special consideration in their fair study? Uh, you know, I, am I muted, unmuted? Um, yep. I think that the uh, the fair study, you know, what I've heard from um, uh, Deborah Johnson and, and Doug McLeod is intended to seek lots of public input and, and especially from equity communities and uh, they're both on. And uh, I think that that uh, my sense is that the, the input we get from everywhere will be um, appreciated and I can reiterate that, but I think you're talking to the right people right now um, <clears throat> about making sure that it's picked up in the process. And, and you know, I can't speak to what the other processes are or how it fits. There's picture of Doug. <laughs> oh, there he is. You froze for a second, but I think we got the gist. Um, both Doug and Deborah turned their cameras on, which makes me think they wanted to chime in with some comments on that. Doug, feel free to go ahead. <clears throat> thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, and, and that's absolutely an intent part of the, um, the, the civil rights legislation with um, Title VI is that our Title VI manager um, is developing a plan currently as we embark on this fair study and equity analysis for an outreach uh, program. That's a huge part of this whole fair study and equity analysis to ensure that we um, get a, a lot of feedback from um, each of the communities that you had, had mentioned, as well as many others um, will have the opportunity. So definitely a very robust process will be um, in, put in place uh, to get public feedback from a cross section of the uh, district. 
And, and one thing I'd like to add, recognizing this will be like no other recognizing, as you said, Madam Chair, early on, as we want to see people return to various activity centers and things of the like. Uh, the reason being with 18 months, we're being very diligent going forward and the FTA has specified recognizing that we're in unprecedented times. When we go about doing this, we wanna ensure that um, the outreach and the population as well as the individuals with whom we gauge are reflective of our community and recognizing right now is just a snapshot of what it used to be in 2019. That's the sole reason why it's taking longer than, than typically it would. And so as we go forward with this, if we bounce back and the road to recovery is paved smoothly, it could be less than that 18 months, but we wanna ensure that we're leveraging so many different aspects of our uh, various populations um, from the equity vantage point to ensure that we understand all pain points and can address those accordingly. Thank you for that. So committee members, we had uh, assigned two hours for this meeting to make sure we had enough time to hear from all of the public and to have any discussion we wanted to have to flag potential changes we wanted to make for our recommendations, but we don't have to belabor it if we don't need that time. So I just wanna um, ask again, if there's any, um, and again, this is not the end time for making changes, but this is to help staff prepare for the next meeting if there are places where we think we might want to fine tune things. So just wanna ask one more time, if based on the public input we've received to date, if there are other areas where you think you might want to tweak things. Is there a link to for the public of our most updated recommendations that we're working off of? Yes, and we have not made any changes from when these went public that, uh, that uh, went out with the survey. One thing I will suggest is since the survey doesn't close till the end of today, anybody that's on social media, go ahead and send out that link and say, last call, we wanna hear from you. Um, and I don't know if um, uh, Matthew, if you could, or Lisa, if you could put in the chat what the link is to send out so that we all can and do, beat the bushes one more time to maximize our public input, that would be great. And I'm assuming silence is acquiescence, Matthew and Lisa, can you do that? Hi, sorry, yep, I'm finding the link now. <laughs> awesome, okay, just wanna make sure you were, you were there. Okay, um, so let's, I'm not, uh, Doug came on. Doug, um, nope, you're good, all right. So I just wanted to just clarify then, what's gonna happen next? We have two weeks, the last bit of public input's gonna come in, we're gonna be able to read through all of this public comment um, and finalize our thoughts on changes that we might wanna make. Those will be discussed and generally vetted on our June 28th meeting. And then we will vote on the final recommendations on our July meeting. Everybody's set on that process. And I'm gonna go out on a limb and suggest if after reading public input in this week, you come up with a, an idea that hasn't been discussed today that you really think we need to look at and change, why don't you email the group and staff and put it on the table so that everybody comes into the June 28th meeting knowing here's the list of things that we're gonna discuss about fine tuning. All right. And with that, everybody's copied the link out of the chat and you're gonna tweet it out so that we, or, or face, Facebook, whatever it is that you do um, to make sure we get public input on our recommendations. And with that, I think we're ready to close out. Any final comments from anybody, Dr. Cog staff, anything we missed? All right, then. Thanks, everybody who uh, came and commented to us today. And thanks, 
uh, to RTD for participating, for Dr. Cog's staff for supporting, and for our committee members for serving. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, all. Bye-bye.